everybody, it's a bit cold and I only have 30 minutes, but um, if I have time at the end, I'll take a couple of questions, so here we go. So for the people who don't know, as a food futurologist, I have to look at everything, although I consult to food companies and food businesses about what we're going to be eating in the future, I have to look at design and politics and economics and everything that's happening in the world really affects what we eat and what we're going to be eating and what we like and what we we may want to be having that we don't know we want. It's a bit like going to Ikea, you're going for a candle and a cushion and you come out with all the things you didn't know you wanted. So, so I look at everything, food packaging, uh, how we eat, what we eat it with, the social experience of eating together. And food is, uh, is not just so simple as I think I like that. There's that sort of taste, and yes, I like the taste of tomatoes, but also it's about taste, and we're the most... We're the most um, trend-driven country in the world in terms of food in the UK. So what we eat is not just dependent on do we like the actual taste of it, but also does it show that we have good taste, and that's a big thing. So when I talk about food, it's not just about the what we'll be eating, but much more about the why we want what we want, why we'll be buying what we buy, and taste is a big part of that, because it's this great social indicator of, of who we think we are, who we'd like other people to think we are. And our history of why we eat what we eat comes from what our parents have eaten, the countries we've grown up in, the places we've also been and travelled, our own personal history and our culture and how we socialise around food. So we tend to have food uh, as a big marker for things like Christmas, Easter, Hanukkah, um, Ramadan, whatever, whatever cultural, uh, religious background we come from, we celebrate those moments and those markers with food. So it's not your birthday unless you have, it's not Christmas morning unless you have you know, we have these things that we, we use as anchors in our day and in our year. And our own identity says a lot about who we are. And we've gone from a time, I think, for most people when we say, hi, I'm John, I'm a Christian, to more like, hi, I'm John, I'm a vegan. So I think that food and our social food groups now are much more about the indicator of the kind of people we hang out with. If you're the sort of person that goes to McDonald's, you probably hang out with other people who go to McDonald's. If you're a staunch political vegan or a paleo person, you probably hang out with other people who eat like you because you tend to group together. So food is already, you can see, just the, the massive space it takes up in our lives. So what I'd like to do is just to show you a couple of the trends that we're seeing at the moment and we're going to be seeing coming up and how, I, how they relate to food, design, everything in the whole spectrum of what we see and what we like and what indicates our preference, whether that's interiors, clothing and of course food itself. So texture is the first, uh, the first thing that I think we're seeing a lot of. Part of that is to counteract this, this, this world that we've been living in for such a long time, which is the flat screen TV world, the very thin, the very um, almost taking up as little space as possible, and wanting to, to re-texturise our space and our world and put some, uh, some meaning back into things. Of course, it's a great interest in a USP. So we've been in flavour for a long time, whether that's salted caramel ice cream to snail... Uh, porridge or bacon and egg ice cream or whatever it is. There's been lots of flavour stuff. The salted caramel is going to be living with us for a long time. It's like the cupcake, it just won't go away. But, but texture's the big thing and we haven't really seen anything fantastic and exciting happening in the world of texture probably since Pop Rocks in the late 60s, early 70s, those popping candy that go in your mouth. So here are some of the things that we're probably going to start seeing in texture. Um, lots of multiple textures. I, I won't bother talking about every single thing, but you'll see the relationships between fashion or interiors or different elements as we go. But we take something that we already know, for example, ice, a lollipop, and we change the texture of it. When we change the texture of it, our mouthfeel experience, the organoleptic experience in the mouth, changes. So we, we've seen that a little bit when Cadbury's changed the shape of the actual nugget of chocolate. It changed the people thinking it's sweeter or it's creamier or all of those things. And it's the same, uh, Toblerone did a great thing. They, when, they, when they made their triangle, of course, it's the least comfortable uh, shape to go into the mouth. We, that's why we like Cadbury's buttons. Something that's round and goes into the roof of the mouth is really pleasing to us. So they made that a USP. They made that triangle a USP. And then, of course, they've taken away some of those triangles, and it's changed the whole experience of a Toblerone. So similarly here, we're, t we're taking something we know which is smooth and creamy and putting angles in it. And then we, even just changing the thickness of the handle, everything changes the, the dining experience, the user experience, the mouthfeel perception. 
We're changing dineware, so the smooth spoon is going away and what's coming in, different types of textured dineware, different shapes of spoons, spoons with lumps and bumps, different types of materials used in spoons or forks or any kind of uh, cutlery. The lips, as you know, if a cup has a thick lip or a very thin lip, makes a difference to your experience. You also see that um, with, the, with the materials of spoons, for example, if you use copper spoon, it's the best thing to eat an egg with. It, en it enhances the flavour of the egg. So there's lots of materials that we're going to start seeing coming in specifically for certain foods. You take something, uh, one of the biggest ingredients that we're going to start seeing in the future, which is definitely connected to texture, is the cheapest ingredient, which is air. And so we take a regular box of chocolates we, and we create something like this so that you see all of the textures of the outside of the cube are different, but the only difference in the ingredient is just cacao. Cacao prices are going up, but the cheapest thing to add in there would be air. So you put some air inside of it, and of course the mouthfeel experience is the same because these corners will touch the edge of your mouth just the same as this will. But of course what you're doing, you're buying yourself a little bit of profit by putting air inside. So Aero and Curly Whirly have thought about this a long time ago, but we haven't gone further than that. So what we're starting to see with air coming in as a, an ingredient or as a texture is that we're seeing air being put into products that we haven't seen before. For example, avocados. So when you take an avocado, a lot of people, most people don't like the foods they don't like because of the texture. So it's slimy, and, and we have certain cultural preferences for things like that. So if you're from a Chinese background, slimy is good. But if you're Western, you think slimy is not so good. So some people might not like avocado because of the texture. When you dry it and you puff it with air, you create a crunchy, on-the-go, uh, one-ingredient product, which, of course, hits all of the, uh, the, kind of the, ta the tabs right now. So when you do that, we're putting air in, which is cheap. We make avocado bigger than it really is because we can have little bits and we puff it with air and, and grow it. So air being a, a volumizer and a retexturizer is going to be a, a big thing in the world of texture and food coming up. So we take a regular chocolate bar and you change the breaking points and change the different shapes of a chocolate bar and suddenly you have a real different experience of just the same old ingredient, which is just cacao. Any kind of digital imprinting, embossing, um, debossing, anything like that we're starting to see coming in in lots of different ways from sushi to different screens, dresses, packaging. Again, similar things like this, so just, just changing up the texture. It's like texture is king um, because we've seen the same sort of materials. Um, some of you might have seen this, it was this Easter where they created these geodes, these chocolate geodes, these massive big geode eggs. You crack through the chocolate and inside it was like a sugar geode. Something about that reveal which is really exciting for us, showing something, taking us back, it's a bit like the kinder surprise for adults. You're thinking that you know uh, on the outside it's known, but on the inside it's a surprise. And that's what texture does, it's about that surprise. So you take the sort of thing that you already know, like an ice cream, and you change the cone, you change the texture of the cone, and by doing that you change the texture of the whole, the whole uh, experience, the whole eating experience. Uh, this is Zuma, a restaurant in London, some of you might have been, and what they've done brilliantly, they've changed, they've got this big, thick, textured, like it's like a textured bedpan really, uh, with a dessert in it, but they've got every single texture from soft pear to hard ice cream to a crack on top to something very soft and caramelised and um, custardy underneath, so they're touching all of those texture points, which gives you something that's very exciting in terms of eating. Again, this is folded chocolate on the right, so that we start to see, a again, a regular chocolate bar, but when it's folded up, it's retexturizing that experience. Lots of roll wear, so retexturing um, things like tops of icing or tops of pies, ways in which you can do this at home so that we're seeing lots of this textured roll wear coming through. See examples of that. It's not just you know, going away from a cake and making it into a pie changing up the textures of things, of objects we already know. Uh, gelatinas, this is uh, the picture on the left, which is, uh, looks a bit like a paperweight. Um, it's Mexican, you turn it upside down, it's a clear gel, looks uh, yeah, just a bit of gelatin. And then it's injected as you wait and watch with different types of fondant icings, so that you can have different types of flowers. The eating experience, you go through a jelly into something that's very creamy and unctuous in the middle. So again, from a, from a dine perspective, you're having these multiple unexpected textures. So, again, I'm just, just showing this with nothing really to do with food, and we've got some plates, but this uneven texture, things that are unexpected, we're coming away from perfection. We've, we've been doing that for a while, and we're doing that more and more, because we're stopping trusting that perfect. The idea of something that's perfect 
we, we've come away a little bit from that clinical white meaning health, and that's why we're going to something which I'll talk about, which is indicating more of a realness. That's because our, our trust has really slipped in our trust in everything, and that really started back when we started to see things like um, the horse meat scandal, then we start to see the big exposés around celebrities. Because like I said, uh, with food, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's happening throughout. Ripples are happening throughout everything. So, so when we start to see the exposés around celebrities like Jimmy Savile and things like that, and we start to see that filtered down into actually what is in our food supply? What is going on in the supply chain? Where are we cutting corners? What does this really mean for us? Can we really trust those labels anymore when they say, um, good for you, healthy? Well, apparently not, because that was actually banned by the, um, the European Commission a couple of years ago, because you could, I mean, cocaine would fit into that gap, you know, it's good for you, it's healthy, it's natural. So, so that, those labeling laws, our trust in things, it's going into this sense of imperfection. So we're seeing things like biscuit manufacturers having different molds for biscuits. So they might have six different molds, all slightly uneven, so that when you buy the packet of biscuits, you start to see them looking a bit like artisan homemade biscuits, even though they are manufactured in a, in a factory. So we're seeing that, of course, in, in across everything. Lots of things, again, like the digital imprinting coming in, but also, uh, I don't know if you've anybody seen these yet, but these are seaweed, uh, seaweed crackers, all very different, a little bit like a sort of vegan pork scratching, I suppose. Uh, so it's rice based on one side and on the other side, seaweed. Lots of stuff in seaweed. I don't have time to talk about all the great stuff that's coming, but seaweed, we haven't even started uh, our journey with that in this country. Um, but there's lots of actual products themselves and ingredients themselves, which, of course, will be more popular popular as we go through the next year or two. Uh, this is the height of amazing textured food. This is, if you could see this as a video on the left, it's actually moving. And when you put it in your mouth, it's a little bit like I'm a celebrity. It's still moving in your mouth like a witch grub or something living. And so that it's, it's tickling your mouth um, as you eat it. And it's moving as though it's alive when you eat it. So this is a couple of uh, different projects that are being developed. And my, uh, this is the inside out Kit Kat. So we just take things we know, we reverse them out, put the wafer on the outside, put the chocolate on the inside. And this is my favorite thing, which I, if anyone here works for Mars, um, I keep speaking to Mars, trying to tell them to make a, a box of these, of these uh, biscuit fingers so that you could put your finger in a finger, dip it into a jar of Nutella, and then eat the whole thing. Who wouldn't want to buy that? Um, I think they've all agreed everybody would want to bite, they just haven't made it yet. So, um, but we're talking about, you know, just thinking of new ways to retexture the eating experience. Um, I was talking about these years ago, and they've finally come through now, where you get a little, the waffle shots. So you have a little bit of a, an ice cream cone cut in half, coated with the different types of chocolate, rimmed with something that's crunchy or textured. And then you, they last for a couple of hours with a coffee in them so that you get the chocolatey experience. You get something crunchy around the rim, and then you also get to eat the actual container itself. And as we go forward, I won't get to talk about all of the different edible types of packaging that's out there, different types of membranes, different types of water bottles, which will kind of dissolve almost a bit like eating from a balloon, and then you eat the balloon. And there's a lot of that kind of thing out there. Um, with fabrics, also seeing this kind of textured fabric. So on the left is this textured fabric, which starts to, when you start to sweat, little vents within the fabric start to open out and let your skin breathe. So, of course, there's... When I talk about the food part, of course, it goes across all of the categories. I love this chocolate bar on the left. This, uh, so you get this perfect shape in your mouth. It's sort of lozenger shape, round, fits into the roof of your mouth. Um, this is a Dutch chocolate. Um, it comes in different layers so that you have a little bit like a cappuccino. You've got one with a little uh, the top, different tastes as it goes through the eating experience. Uh, I love the peelable banana ice cream and the tights to match. Perfect. So the next trend is back to the land. Again, talking about this sense that we need to connect to something more meaningful, that we're coming away from this idea of perfection, whiteness, purity, and we're going to something that's soil and blackness, which you see the rise of things like uh, we're going to see more and more uh, imperfect vegetables coming back, soil on our vegetables. We already see that in things like vegetable boxes that we can get, going to the market, getting real food again, what that means. So 
for me, the supermarket is panicking because we was a, there was a time, some of you will remember, when having all of the things to buy in one shop was the most exciting thing ever. Who would want to go to the butcher and the baker when you could get it all in one shop? And now, of course, we want those artisan stores. We want to be able to go back to the high street and have those relationships. So what supermarkets will do, they'll try and create that within the one, uh, the one space. But we want to go to this sense of soil and blackness and dirt and realness so much more. So we're seeing the digital detox, people going away, all the glamping and camping and uh, getting away from it all, the experience that people don't want to go on a package holiday. They want to go somewhere where they have a sense of kind of survival. So one of the other things which I won't have time to talk about is this sense of survival, this, the sense that we're going to start seeing ideas of ration packs and ration boxes across in lots of different things, whether it's a fashion ration box or whether that's actually a food ration box. And we start to see these little indicators come in. For example, I would imagine there's a lot of women here, specifically women, who will have some type of food in their bag, whether that's a few nuts, a, a chocolate bar, um, because how will you possibly survive for the next day, the whole of today, without some snack? It's, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? You're, you're out there already surviving in London, thinking, <laughs> how will I possibly get from the tube to another tube and not need something to eat and not find a shop to get something in? Because we're already doing it. We started to see that coming through with things like drinks on the go, or everybody carrying water around. We're already in this. You know, so when I map these trajectories of trend, I try to look at the things that we start to take for granted that we think is normal. So I know when my father, who was living in Argentina, came back to the UK, hadn't been here for a long time, said, why is everyone walking around with a coffee? Why don't you just have a cup of coffee and then go about your day? And I said, oh, it's all, yeah. But, and, what, and what about this bottled water thing? Just have some water, leave the house, and then get some water later on when you go home. He couldn't understand us. Oh, well, it's, you know, it's like it's modern living. So, so, you know, here we are. We're in this time with survival. And we're going to see this more and more about against environmental issues, against how we can get hold of what we need when we need it. And this will extend even further into the bespoke need for ourselves so that we'll have a device. We breathe into the device. We've already have had our DNA done. Um, this device will know everything that we need. We'll breathe into the device. It will tell us that morning, okay, we're slightly deficient in B12 and magnesium. We'll take our device, we'll scan it around our kitchen. It will beep on all of the things where we personally can absorb and get that, that bit of nutrition in our house. If we haven't got it in our house, we'll go to the supermarket and we'll scan it around the supermarket and it will beep for all the things that we can absorb that day that we personally need to fulfill our needs. So when we're talking about survival, it will be individual survival. And that's why one diet doesn't fit all, which we already know. Some of you have done the 5-2 and you lost five stone and other people did 5-2 and gained three pounds. So you know, we are so unique and different and we're going to start seeing that playing out. And these ration packs, these survival ideas will be coming really bespoke for each person. I've digressed. Okay, so here we are. We're <laughs> so we're talking about this sense of blackness. So whether it's squidding, whether it's uh, black sesame, whether it's charcoal, are we just seeing this charcoal peel off mask? I don't know if anyone saw the video on YouTube of that girl peeling the mask off and screaming while it's pulling all her facial hair out and all that. She didn't even know she had a beard until she wore one of those and then found it was very painful. But we're seeing lots of things in charcoal coming in. And I just was recently in, a, in LA in a, in a flat that had a bag of activated um, coconut husk charcoal. And I, and I know this was quite good. And so I started taking it by day three. Everything coming out of my body was black and also I was so dehydrated I thought I was in like Sahara Desert because it not just absorbs toxins but also absorbs every bit of moisture in your body. But charcoal is you know, going to see that more and more in food coming through. Lots of black things. Of course, things like you know, interiors, but this sense of blackness not necessarily being cool anymore, but, but uh, about health and related to health. One of the things also with black that's uh, slightly going to change our perception of wearing black, and this is uh, something that's uh, kind of separate, is that we're starting to see lots of groups taking over black clothing and making it their own, one of which would be ISIS. So our connotations around black and Japanese designers and all of the things about black being cool, this will change. And over the next five years, we're going to having a different relationship as wearers of black clothes. We're going to start thinking about it in a slightly different way when, we, when it becomes a, 
repositioned, I suppose, with a lot of groups that we might not want to be associated with. And for a lot of people here, you might not remember, but you might have thought that you know, wearing black, head to toe in black, is something that we've always done. But it's actually only really started in the 80s, um, apart from Victorian morning wear and things like that. Really, for uh, all of us in this room, in the 80s really was the beginning of wearing head to toe black and that being sort of clean Japanese lines or Izimayaki, Yamamoto. At the same time, uh, of course, in parallel to that, when things like sushi became available on the shelves in the supermarkets in the 80s. So the rise of black clothes, late 80s, and also Japanese food being acceptable in the West, in the UK, coming together in parallel. So with black, it's going to shift into a health space, into a soil space. We're going to start seeing things like real soil soup made from real soil. So it will be looking at the quality and the perfection of the soil, which is pretty rare, so that there'll be special harvesting areas for soil, for soil soup, where we know there's lots of nitrates, lots of selenium, lots of good stuff in soil uh, coming through. So sort of seeing that sort of thing in fashion as well, this sort of earthiness and um, this sense of nature rather than that way that it came before, which was that sort of Japanese um, style. And again, um, things about eating out, burning your food, charcoal, uh, really making it in a very basic way. This, this basics, will, we're going to start connecting to black rather than a slickness. Anything to do with seaweeds, earthiness, that sort of imperfection, um, something about going back to the land. And there's a lot of things in that space. Of course, it's growing your own, um, having different types of ways. There's lots of air plants coming in at the moment. Um, things in which we can uh, associate with, with, um, with, the, uh, with the earth and the land that we feel very disconnected to. Especially in London, especially in the cities, you might have seen, I think it's a couple of weeks ago, there's a Sweaty Betty campaign that says something like, escape from the city, and then you'd get a pair of leggings and I don't know, run away out of the city, I don't know, running away in your active wear, you might have seen that. Um, Kidult, another trend that we're seeing a lot. Kidult, some of you might be in the room. Uh, you basically want to escape from the grown-up responsibility. So you'd be between 20 and 30, possibly still living with your parents. This is a fantastic market for agencies, for anyone who wants to sell stuff, because this, this market between 20 and 30 have money, because they're not paying much because they're living with their parents. Often it's called the curling generation. So the parents have kind of uh, cleared a path for these... these um, adults to come through. So in some ways they are living in a little bit of an idealised world and are a little afraid of growing up and they like Disney films, they like whimsy, they, uh, they're the first generation to really read the labels so they might look at food and say oh okay uh, that's really good for me, I'm going to have a salad for lunch but I've been really good so I'm going to have some Haribo sweets with faces on as a snack because it's a trade-off. So there's a lot of this trade-off behaviour with the sharing generation of adults. So they love sugar and they love fun things, and this really speaks to them. Motifs, things with faces, food with faces, uh, colour, uh, playful. It's, it's a real playful thing. So definitely anything that looks like something, whether it's their food, whether it's a necklace, whether it's jewellery, whether it's interiors, it's that sense of something um, that for people who haven't really grown up. You might have seen this at, I think it's Train, which is um, a big matcha ice cream surrounded by a big load of candy floss. Now this is, looks like it's for kids, but those kids are 27 years old. You might have some living with you. Um, lots of pink, lots of fun, you know, macaron-shaped little pet purses, things that you'd think were maybe for a six-year-old girl, but are uh, much more for something who's much older than that. Hello Kitty, bottles of water, uh, studded with Swarovski crystals, probably 30 quid a bottle, um, but perfect for that generation who've got a little bit more money and... Uh, not as much sense about what to spend it on, perhaps. Sorry. You know, crazy fun handbags for children that would be something that you probably would think about giving to children. And the finally, because I know I've only got very little time, um, going a little bit further forward is the disruption trend. So I've been following this trend. I talked about Trump getting in about a year ago and Brexit. Um, I wish I'd put money on it. I wouldn't be here now if I had. Uh, if I'd done the thing with Leicester City, I think I would have been in like, like six million. If you put bet on all three, you got six million, something like that. Anyway, I missed that. I don't know anything about football. So, so this is a disruption trend. We're going to see more lawlessness, more overcrowding, natural disasters, a dissent. Um, and one of the things I talked about was this sense of perfection. And we're going to what we might call from this position, ugliness. 
Although whenever we get to a trend, it's always normal. Whenever we look back, it's always weird. Did we really do that? I can't believe it. And, and when, we, um, when we look at the future, it always seems ridiculous. Now, I would never possibly wear a crop top and Ugg boots, and then people were, again, wearing crop top and Ugg boots. You know, all of those things that you look back and go, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I wore a crop top and Ugg boots. So, that, that, you know, as you know, we're all in that, that circle of, um, of impossible. So we're seeing the freak shakes coming in, things that the anti-fashion fashion, lots of clashing, lots of things that we might think right now aren't really um, beautiful. One of the things we'll see is makeup that looks like scratches and burns and uh, brutal, types of, um, brutal types of face wear. Uh, this is an armadillo cake, that's its guts spilling out. It's the sort of thing you'll definitely be serving at a dinner party. De de uh, dis disfiguring things, disfiguring, which we would call now disfiguring yourself, so that we're in a phase right now where I'm seeing a lot of adults in the UK, um, possibly in the US also, wearing braces. It's quite new for us to do that. You know, we might have had them if we desperately needed them as a child, but you, we, I'm seeing lots of people I know now with like a little tooth slightly out and having a brace put on. Oh, these are cups, by the way, that look like they've been made by a child, but they'll, they'll be beautiful. You'll think they're gorgeous in a couple of years. Um, but what we're seeing now with the braces is that uh, place people in Japan are having braces put on to make their teeth stick out. They're having their teeth uh, chipped, purposefully chipped, and things that w would look to us like um, making things imperfect. That wabi-sabi type... Uh, type place to go with even you, with your own face. So while we're still thinking about perfection, we're already coming away from it. So some people are already realizing, okay, maybe Botox isn't for me. Maybe those lips are too big. Maybe those perfect selfies on Facebook where everyone's gorgeous and you've edited that out all of the 25 that didn't work. Um, you know, with the, this curation of this perfect life, we're starting to see that it's not attainable, it's not sustainable, that people don't believe it anymore. So much bigger, uh, even just last week with Prince Harry talking about mental health, we start to realise that everyone's feeling not good enough on some level or not perfect enough, not rich enough, not beautiful enough. So we're going to start coming away from that and flipping to the other side, which is this sense of disruption, this real, real imperfection. Uh, this is a, a, this lovely uh, shower mat where you step out and when it's wet it looks like you're bleeding. Um, I, I like that. Uh, this is a, a, a sort of makeup that um, I can aspire to. Oh, these are the braces. This is a woman. So this is before, and she, before she had the brace on and then this is after the brace so her teeth stick out. And this sense of uh, you know, having these table settings specially for you, so it might just look like it's been uh, messed up at a, at a picnic, but this is the before the picnic. And when we're thinking about Instagram photos of food, which I see and play around with myself a lot, and although I have to uh, keep within the moment that we're in right now, which is the top down, you know, right now we're in the moment of the bowl, the top down bowl with the blueberry that's just escaped. We're living in that aspirational time where we're all trying to be healthier. We want to indicate that, we want to show that we've got it together and we are doing a bit of meditation and yoga on the side. And that's the kind of look that we're trying to show through our photography, whether that's of ourselves or our food, because it's the same thing. But this is where we're going. It's kind of repulsive, dog's dinner, school dinners, disgusting. And this is what we'll be aspiring to. So this will be how real we are. And the restaurants that we go to, we're already seeing those menus coming way down from the big wipeable menu of 50 choices to this is what's on today. You can have this or don't bother. And I think that's where we're going. It's getting right back to that realness. Again, fabulous, fabulous clothing and cakes and such where it's just really been made by monkeys. And this idea of things, you know, this three-legged chair that's uh, a little bit uh, uncomfortable perhaps, but that's where we're going. People can come and set fire to your uh, dinner party for you um, so that it really does look good for the moment. And uh, this is Reiki, uh, Riot Reiki, so you can get the bottle of Reiki uh, and you peel the label off, which is made from fabric, you roll it up, you stick it in the top, like so, and I don't know, maybe set fire to it and throw it at someone? I think of anything. But that's, this is the sort of thing we're talking about with this societal disruption. This is a dinner party, you bring, uh, you bring these, the, these things are brought to your table and you pay someone to blow these up at your dinner party, it's, and uh, it's exciting, apparently. This is a great band in South Africa. I don't know the name of the band, I can't remember, but when you see their videos... What are they called? The Antwerp. 
Die Antwort? Die Antwort. When you, if you have a look at their videos on YouTube, it's disturbing. And that's the kind of disturbing that I'm talking about as we go into this sense of disruption. There's just something about what they're doing and how they're doing it, which makes me uncomfortable. So I realize that there's something in that. It, you think you've almost seen everything by now. However, I don't think we've quite seen the level of, oh, I don't know, something odd about this. I think this is going to go forward. A another uh, explosion at your table um, idea. Uh, Badges that look like uh, postular boils. Uh, this is the makeup for men. Just, of course, it's this sense of disruption. I think you're getting the picture. A nice baby shower cake. <laughs> so, um, just to wrap up, because I know I've completely run out of time, but I just wanted to just sort of give you the sense that food doesn't exist in a vacuum. And this is my favorite quote. Um, it's, it's actually hundreds of years old, but I think it's just as relevant today. That the charisma of food is capacity to be everything. It is identity and culture and history. It is science and nature and botany. It is the earth. It is our family, our philosophy and our past. It is the most important matter in our lives. It's more than its ingredients. It is transcendent. But it's also just dinner. It means nothing. It is serious and it's not. Thank you.